September 1925, Denver, Colorado. In a conference room above the Denver and Rio Grande Western's headquarters, a quiet argument simmered among executives. American railroading was rushing toward heavier mainline traffic, standard gauge consolidation, and increasingly powerful locomotives. The age of narrow gauge railroads with their lighter rails, tighter curves, and mountain-bound branch lines seemed to be ending. No modern railroad man believed the future belonged to locomotives built for three-foot track. That was the atmosphere into which the Baldwin Locomotive Works proposed the K-36 class, a new series of narrow-gauge 282 Mikado engines built for the DNRGW. Most executives dismissed the idea immediately. Why pour money into lines they expected to abandon within decades? Why develop a new locomotive for a gauge nearly every major railroad was replacing? And why rely on a design so simple compared to the complex superpower engines of the 1920s? Internal memos at the time called narrow gauge a fading mode of transportation. And some officials warned the K-36s would be too limited in hauling ability to justify their cost. A few younger engineers went further. They doubted the locomotives would even survive the Colorado winters, notorious for snowdrifts that swallowed tracks and temperatures that made metal snap like glass. Crews shared the skepticism. Firemen joked that Baldwin was building antiques brand new. Conductors doubted the 3,600 pounds of tractive effort was enough to push trains up the unforgiving 4% grades of the San Juan extension. Veteran engineers said the boilers were too large for the light rails, the drivers too small for speed, and the mechanical layout too plain to endure years of hard mountain work. But DNRGW was trapped. The San Juan, Chama, and Alamosa districts still relied on narrow-gauge freight, timber, livestock, coal, and farm goods, all needing locomotives that could handle tight curves, sharp switchbacks, and high altitudes. They needed reliable, not glamorous. So despite every doubt, the railroad placed the order. When the first K-36 rolled out of Baldwin's Philadelphia erecting shop later that year, few could imagine that this old-fashioned engine, dismissed before it turned a wheel, would outlive entire divisions, survive the collapse of narrow-gauge freight, and face one winter after another until the century mark approached. What nobody believed in was about to redefine what a mountain engine could endure. When the first K-36 locomotives rolled into Colorado between 1925 and 1926, they looked out of place on the narrow-gauge lines they were meant to serve. To many who saw them for the first time, they seemed far too heavy too tall and too ambitious for rails that twisted through the San Juan Mountains like threads laid along a cliff face. Narrow-gauge crews were used to smaller, lighter engines that could slip through tight curves and survive on lightly built track. The K-36, by contrast, arrived with the bulk and posture of a standard-gauge engine forced onto rails never meant for such weight. Colorado's narrow-gauge geography only added to the doubts. These locomotives were expected to run daily over routes like Cumbrus Pass, climbing above 10,000 feet where air thinned, steam production dropped, and long grades punished any machine not perfectly suited for the territory. The line through Toltec Gorge clung to canyon walls, its curves so sharp they forced trains to bend like articulated snakes. On both routes, grades reached 4%, a figure considered extreme even by seasoned mountain railroaders. Many locomotives that attempted these climbs overheated, slipped uncontrollably, or simply lacked the power to move tonnage at all. For these conditions, the K-36 seemed almost stubbornly conventional. It had no experimental superheating system, no exotic valve motion, and no radical, weight-saving innovations. Instead, Baldwin gave it an oversized boiler that could generate steady pressure even in thin mountain air, a long wheelbase for stability on rough track, and a firebox designed for continuous punishing work. Its drivers were small enough to produce enormous torque, but large enough to avoid excessive wheel spin on icy rails. The locomotive's frame was heavy, rigid, and intentionally overbuilt, allowing it to withstand the pounding of mountain trackage year after year. Early test runs surprised crews who expected the engines to stall halfway up Cumbres. Instead, the K-36 dug into the grade with a firmness that contradicted nearly every prediction made in the Denver boardrooms. The locomotive moved slowly but relentlessly 
gathering momentum around curves that had defeated larger engines and holding steam pressure where others faltered. For the first time, it became clear that the design rejected as too simple might have been engineered with an entirely different purpose in mind. Not elegance, but endurance. And the mountains were only the beginning of what these engines would be forced to survive. Winter was the one obstacle no executive calculation could accurately predict. The DNRGW's narrow-gauge empire crossed some of the highest, regularly operated rail lines in North America where the arrival of snow did not simply complicate operations. It transformed the entire railroad into a survival exercise. Temperatures regularly plunged far below zero, winds blew hard enough to bury tracks in minutes, and long cuts between ridges acted as natural snow traps that filled faster than crews could clear them. Many locomotives that performed well in summer simply fell apart under these conditions. Before the K-36s arrived, winter had forced smaller engines into endless cycles of repairs. Boilers cooled too quickly and cracked. Injector lines froze overnight. Valve gear stiffened under layers of ice. And fireboxes struggled to maintain pressure in thin, frigid air. Dispatchers assumed the new engines would suffer the same fate. In fact, some officials believed the K-36 would fare even worse since a larger boiler meant more metal exposed to the cold and more water that could freeze inside vulnerable pipes. More than one crewman predicted the engines wouldn't last a single full season on Combris Pass, but the first winter turned those doubts on their heads. The K-36s proved unusually resistant to the cold, partly because their boilers retained heat far longer than the older locomotives they replaced. Even after a long overnight shutdown, internal temperatures dropped slowly enough to reduce the risk of ice forming in critical lines. Their heavy frames held warmth deep into the metal, making morning starts more reliable, and the straightforward layout of their external piping allowed crews to reach and thaw problem areas quickly without disassembling half the locomotive. What truly surprised crews was how the K-36 behaved in deep snow. The locomotive generated enormous torque at low speed, allowing it to push through drifts that stopped lighter engines dead in their tracks. On Cumbres Pass, where storms sometimes erased rails under several feet of packed snow, the K-36s moved steadily forward, their exhaust echoing through whiteout conditions as plow crews struggled to keep up. Even when visibility vanished entirely, the engines advanced with a kind of stubborn determination that impressed even the most skeptical engineers. Winter, once feared as the great equalizer, became the season that revealed the K-36's true nature. It was not simply a freight locomotive, it was a machine built to endure. And winter proved it long before the railroad ever did. For most locomotives, service on the DNRGW's narrow-gauge system would have been punishment enough. But the K-36s were assigned not to the easy districts, but to the most unforgiving lines in the entire Rocky Mountain region. These routes were essential for hauling lumber, livestock, mineral ore, and coal, yet they were notorious among railroaders for the toll they took on both men and machines. It was here, in this labyrinth of steep passes and fragile trestles, that the K-36 earned its reputation. The climb up Cumbers Pass was the first crucible. The grade rose relentlessly at 4%, forcing locomotives to work at full throttle for long stretches with almost no chance to recover steam pressure. At high elevations, thinner air robbed boilers of efficiency, meaning that firemen had to shovel harder just to keep the locomotive alive. Many older engines struggled to maintain even the bare minimum pressure required to move tonnage. The K-36, however, showed an unusual ability to sustain its power. Its large firebox and generous boiler surfaces gave it the breathing room other locomotives lacked, allowing it to build steam steadily instead of in desperate bursts. Farther west lay the dramatic cliffs of Toltec Gorge. The narrow-gauge line here was carved directly into rock faces, forcing trains to navigate curves so tight that engineers could look back and see half the cars trailing behind them like a steel ribbon. On these sections, the K-36's long wheelbase and careful weight distribution became an unexpected advantage. The locomotive settled into the rails with a firmness that reduced side-to-side -side motion, making it more predictable and stable than earlier designs that bounced and twisted under heavy loads. 
Beyond the prominent passes were dozens of lesser-known stretches that tested the locomotives in quieter, more insidious ways. Lightly maintained sidings, frost-heaved rails, and trestles exposed to wind and ice created uneven track conditions that punished any engine not built with durability in mind. The combination of heavy tonnage, low speeds, and constant grade changes would have worn out many locomotives within a decade. But the K36 absorbed the punishment. Instead of developing frame cracks or boiler leaks common to lighter engines, it settled into a rhythm uniquely suited to mountain freight. The harsher the territory became, the more the K36 seemed to thrive. As if the lines themselves were shaping the locomotive into something tougher than its designers had ever expected. By the early 1930s, the K36 class had become a familiar sight on the DNRGW's high country lines. But it was during the decade's brutal winters that their reputation shifted from capable mountain engines to something closer to legend. Colorado storms could immobilize entire districts overnight. Snow piled in drifts higher than boxcars. Avalanches buried cuts without warning. And the effort required to keep trains moving pushed railroads to the brink every year. Many locomotives simply could not endure this repeated punishment. Yet increasingly, when the rest of the division was forced to shut down, the K-36s continued moving. Railroad diaries from the period described storms where all standard gauge operations east of the Rockies were suspended while narrow-gauge dispatchers quietly sent a K-36 up Cumbrus Pass with a plow attached, trusting it to break trail through snow that even rotary plows struggled against. The locomotives did not plow quickly or dramatically, but they advanced with a slow, digging persistence that seemed to ignore conditions entirely. Their low driver size allowed them to maintain steady torque even when rails were hidden beneath layers of wind-packed snow and the heavy weight of the frame kept them grounded when lighter engines would have slipped helplessly. Crews working atop the pass often noted how the K-36 retained internal heat long after shutdown, a quality that made restarts far more reliable in sub-zero weather. The massive boiler radiated warmth through the frames and piping, reducing the risk of frozen injectors or cracked water lines, common failures among smaller locomotives. Firemen discovered that even after a night buried in snow, a K-36 could often be revived with a fraction of the effort required for older engines. But the most impressive moments came during the infamous multi-day blizzards that isolated entire towns. The railroad would send telegraphs asking whether any locomotive could break through. Often the answer was no, except for one of the K-36s. These engines hauled supply trains to communities cut off by snow, pushed stranded freights back down the mountain, and in some cases ran nearly around the clock with only short breaks for crews to rest and clear accumulated ice. Winter was supposed to expose the weaknesses of narrow gauge. Instead, it highlighted the K-36's greatest strength, an ability to function not just in spite of extreme weather, but within it, as if the engines had been built explicitly for these frozen mountains. By the mid-20th century, the Denver and Rio Grande Western was steadily retreating from its narrow-gauge routes. Standard-gauge diesel locomotives were spreading across the system, offering more power, lower operating costs, and reduced maintenance demands. The company expected the remaining narrow-gauge lines to fade out, and with them the aging steam locomotives that had served for decades. On paper, the K-36s should have been among the first to disappear. They were built for a mode of railroading executives no longer believed in, and their coal-fired boilers belonged to an era the industry was eager to leave behind. Yet the opposite happened. One by one, the more modern locomotives, equipped with experimental superheaters, advanced valve gear, or lightweight components, began to suffer from the very conditions the K-36s had been surviving for decades. Engines introduced in the 1930s and 1940s cracked their frames under heavy winter pounding, struggled to maintain steam at high altitude, or proved too delicate for rough mountain track. Their advanced designs, impressive in theory, simply weren't built to endure the punishing environment of Colorado's high country. The K-36s kept going. Maintenance records from the 1950s reveal a clear pattern. While newer locomotives required extensive overhauls after a few winters, the K-36s consistently returned from mountain assignments with fewer frame issues, fewer boiler repairs, and far fewer mechanical failures. Their simple, rugged construction, once criticized as outdated, proved to be the very reason they survived. There were fewer parts to freeze, fewer joints to crack, 
and fewer experimental systems to fail. The K36s were not sophisticated machines. They were resilient ones. As narrow-gauge lines gradually shut down, the K36s remained in service almost by necessity. They were the only locomotives still reliable enough to haul freight over the remaining routes. Coal trains, stock cars, and mixed freights continued to rely on them well into the 1960s, long after the DNRGW had hoped to retire steam entirely. Even when traffic dwindled, the railroad kept them operational because they were the only engines that consistently started on cold mornings, pulled tonnage without complaint, and returned home in working order. In a twist, few could have predicted the locomotives dismissed as outdated became the backbone of the final years of narrow-gauge freight. They outlasted their modern replacements not by innovation, but by endurance, a quiet durability that no executive had valued when the class was first proposed. By the time the last narrow-gauge freight operations wound down in the late 1960s, the K-36 class had already defied every prediction ever made about their lifespan. Executives who once claimed they would never last a winter live long enough to see them haul freight for more than 40 years. Engineers who doubted the design watched as the locomotives survived storms, derailments, washouts, and the slow collapse of the narrow-gauge network itself. And when the DNRGW finally stepped away from the mountain lines, the K-36s remained standing, not as relics, but as working machines, with decades of service still left in them. Their transition into the modern era was almost accidental. Tourist railroads inherited them because they were simply the most dependable engines available, not because anyone imagined they would become icons of American rail heritage. Yet on the Combres and Toltec Scenic Railroad and the Durango and Silverton Narrow Gauge Railroad, the K-36s found a second life that proved just how well Baldwin had built them. Many of these locomotives now exceed 90 years of age, yet still climb the same grades, round the same curves, and echo through the same mountain passes as they did when the DNRGW first tested them. Maintenance crews on these heritage lines frequently remark on how predictable the locomotives are. Their frames remain remarkably sound, their boilers continue to meet pressure standards, and their valve gear shows the kind of wear expected from heavy service, but not the catastrophic fatigue one might expect from locomotives approaching a century of operation. In many cases, the greatest challenge in keeping them running comes not from the engines themselves, but from sourcing parts for a mechanical era that no longer exists. Historians today point to the K-36 as one of the rare examples where a locomotive class not only exceeded expectations, but effectively rewrote the narrative around its intended role. They were meant to be stopgap engines for a dying branch of railroading. Instead, they became the last surviving proof of what narrow-gauge power could accomplish when built with the right balance of force, simplicity, and durability. A century after railroads dismissed them as outdated and unnecessary, the K-36s are still at work, hauling passengers, climbing mountains, and proving every winter that the locomotive nobody believed in was the one built strong enough to endure them all.